chapter three is about the concept of logic. So remember this class is kind of a bunch of basically disconnected concepts so that you get to know some aspects of math and we just go real fast on a surface level through these things. So we talked about sets for a few sections. You saw some really basic things about sets and the same things are going to be true with logic. We're going to go through logic for a few sections. You're going to see some really basic things about logic and we're going to get ourselves to the point where we understand what, a, what an argument is and what a valid and an invalid argument is. And that's where we will get by the time we're at the end of this section. So what we're going to do today is we're going to spend most of our time doing just some of the nitty gritty basic things of defining some terms and understanding how we can uh, how we can take English sentences and make them into mathematical statements and then when we come back next week we will talk about connecting statements together and how that affects the truth value of statements and things like that so uh, just to just to let you know so today might be just a little bit dry at some points but i'll try to keep it I'll try to keep it as light and fun as possible. So let's see, where am I on this little board? So, we can okay. so section 3.1, we're gonna talk about logic statements. Would you say this section is harder than logic? Um, you know, I don't want to make a general statement because everybody is different on these. Some people like the set stuff and some people absolutely do not. And the same thing's true of the logic and the same thing would be true of the probability stuff. So I think it's just my hope. Anytime I teach this class or I teach explorations in math, which is kind of the, the twin of this, my hope is just that there's at least one unit that you find and you're like, you know what? Even though I hate all the algebra that I had to do for six years of my high school and middle school life, like there's some there's some aspect of math that I can appreciate just a little bit uh, because not all math is algebra. So to answer your question, that was a long winded answer to it's hard to say. It just depends on who you are. So this is different, though. That's for sure. We're not going to be uh, doing intersections and unions anymore. We're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about truth values and we're going to talk about whether an argument is valid or invalid um, and then at the very end of this we'll draw some pictures that do look like venn diagrams but they're they're completely uh, they're completely different so the first thing is the idea of what a statement is and so a statement is something it is uh, it, it's something that can be either true or false Something, I think I was about to write something. So, my statement is an idea that I can link together with a truth value. Something's either true or false. So, I have a few simple statements that I'm going to, to write here on the board. And we're going to assign a truth or a false value to this, and we'll reuse these statements. So the first one is the capital. Is that how you spell capital? I think so. Of Florida is Orlando. And you may or may not know the answer to this question, so maybe you're going to learn a little bit about uh civics here for just a moment but is that a true statement or a false statement is the capital of orlando or capital of florida orlando that's false in case you didn't know the capital of florida is actually tallahassee so this is an idea that i can attach a truth or a, a true or a false uh value to it so the value of this is false so here's the next one just to have a couple of examples. Winter Haven is in Polk County. Is that a true or a false statement? Okay, that one's true. Yeah, we're, we are standing in Polk County right now. Great, that is true. The last one. Last of our examples, 
all of my pens are deciding today is the day not to work anymore. So we'll just stick with this one since I know it works. Here's the last one, Mr. Perkins. Is balding. <laughs> Thank you. I can see you're clearly thinking about your final grade in this class. Don't worry, I know I can look at pictures. Mr. Perkins is balding. This is a true statement. Now, the reason I mention this, okay, is be, be, because don't confuse in logic the truth value of something with whether you like that thing or not. Okay, so whether or not I like going bald, it doesn't change the, the fact that that is actually happening. Okay, so uh, the truth and the false value is independent of our feelings uh, on that matter. So each of these three statements right here is what's called a simple statement. And a simple statement, it, it just conveys one idea. Each of those three statements conveys one idea to us. Simple statements aren't super fun, okay? We kind of get bored with them real quick because they're either true or false and there's not much you can do with them. So what we're gonna spend a bunch of time doing is creating what's called compound statements. Compound statements are two or more simple statements joined together with what we're gonna call connectives. And I'm gonna define that term for you in just a minute, but a compound statement is two or more, Simple statements joined with connectives. And so, what we're going to spend our time here doing for the rest of our uh, however long it takes to do this is we're going to look at compound statements. I'm going to introduce you to the five connectives that we're going to see as we go through this. And then we're going to kind of spend a bunch of time looking at how we can convert statements that are written into math mathematical things that we can use. Okay, so that and that's going to be a big skill for us as we go through. So the first of our connectives is not really actually, it doesn't actually connect anything. The first of what are called the connectives just does its work on a simple statement and it's called the negation. And what the negation does is it's like the on off switch. All it does is it changes the truth value. Yes, it's the first of our five connectives. Although the negation does not connect two statements together, it does act on a statement. And so that's why it gets tossed in into this discussion. So without giving the answer, I know I told you the capital of Florida is, is Tallahassee, but that's not what I wanna do. What can I do? Here, we've said that this statement here is false. The capital of Florida is Orlando. That's false. What word can I add to that statement in order to change the truth value? Not. Not. Perfect. So this capital of Florida is not Orlando. And that becomes a true statement. Okay, so we've just created the negation. Now, I know it's a super simple thing to do, but humor me because this does get helpful for you as we go through this class. Just real quick, write down the negation to these two other simple statements for me, if you don't mind, even if you do mind.
know, so again, this fairly simple task to do to warm up for us on this Thursday as we're thinking about the weekend. So we said originally that Winter Haven is in Polk County. That's a true statement. So I negate that by saying Winter Haven is not in Polk County. That's a false statement. Mr. Perkins is balding. That was again true. Mr. Perkins is not balding. That's the false statement. So that's how we negate. Now, we're going to call a timeout because there's three types of statements that we need to talk about how to negate because they're not necessarily as straightforward as you would think. These are these actually, the, this, this thing right here uh, tends to be the most missed thing on the test that I will give in, in this chapter. So this is a good thing to put a little asterisk on and make sure that you that you practice this. And what we're going to talk about is negating quantifiers. And you might think, well, what in the world is a quantifier? That is a great question. I'm glad you're thinking it. Quantifiers are statements that start with the words all, some, or none. There's some quantity that is assumed. And so we have to talk about what it means to negate them. For instance, here's my example. And then I've got a couple examples that you will do. The example is this all cell phones take pictures. I don't care. Uh, I don't care about the truth value, false value about that. That's not our point at this at this moment. What I want to know is what's the negation? What changes the truth value of that? whatever it is okay you that's why we're here we're learning and you've said the most common thing that the most common mistake the negation of all is not the same none because none is just another all statement none is all are not okay so another way to say none is all all are not so if 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 we had a bet, if we were betting $10, and I said, I'm going to bet you $10 that all cell phones take pictures, what do you have to show me? All no, you don't have to show me all cell phones. You just got to show me one, right? You just have to show me, if I say 10 bucks says all cell phones take pictures, all you have to do is go to some a pawn shop and find an old flip phone and show it to me and there it is you, you have now contradicted you've changed the truth value so the negation of all cell phones take pictures is some cell phones do not take pictures So this is how this is how the negation of a quantifier works. And if you had the printed book, I would show you this chart. But since you don't, I'm going to write it on the board. Remember, you have an ebook in my math lab if you ever take the time. Like if something's not super clear or not well defined, but I've done it. You can go and and everything is is interactive in that textbook. It's actually quite great. So here is here is the chart though. We just saw that the negation of all are something is that some are not. And this goes back and forth. If I say, if I say uh, some are not, then the negation of that is all are. Okay, those two things go hand in hand. These are the negation of each other. If I give you something that says none are, and just to fit the pattern, the way I like to the way I like to do it is to say all are not. None is the same thing as all are not. Then the negation of that is some are. Yeah, what you do to make the negation is two things. 
Either way, you change the all to a sum or the sum to an all. Okay. And then if it's a positive statement, you make it negative. If it's a negative statement, like all or not, you make it positive. Okay, that's how the negation works. We're going to practice this a couple of times because it's fun and I understand. So uh, this is one that, like I said earlier, this is one of the most commonly missed things that, that we see. So These are just statements I'm reading from the book, so uh, that's that's where these are coming from. In case you're wondering where these crazy things are coming, from. some insects are mammals. And just write the negation to that. Okay, so I've, I've left this over here. So the opposite of any, now you can memorize this. That's a great thing to do. Here's how I have it stored in my mind. Okay, so I'm giving you a little insight into what's going on in here, which is probably very scary. I always change my sum to an all. Okay, sum becomes all, insects. And then I change my positive to a are not mammals. Now you might be saying, well, Mr. Perkins, I wrote none. Exactly. Or you could just say, instead of all insects are not mammals, you could say no insects. These mean the same thing. Okay, these mean the same thing. This just helps me because it follows the pattern. That's why I like to write all are not instead of none. I will accept either. So if you just remember this little relationship right here, then you are good to go. Okay, so they, they mean the exact same thing. Here's another one for you. Some days, again, this is from the book, are not Mondays. Write the negation of that. So again, the opposite of a sum is all days. And instead of are not, I'm just going to change that to the positive, are Mondays. We are. Right. So we are not concerned okay. right now with the truth value. We are just writing the negation because okay. what the negation does is it changes the truth value. Okay, so you're right. This is a true statement, right? This is false, right? All days are all our days are not Monday days. Clearly, the calendar says there's other there's other words there. So again, don't. Yeah, this is such a great point, and I'm glad you're making it right now because you're going to see goofier things than this as we go through. So, and part of what the book is trying to implore on you is, is don't get hung up on the truth values. We, uh, the, the logic can be independent of that. Okay, so I know that doesn't make necessarily make sense. I know it's hard to grasp at first. So all we're doing here is we are not 
I did not say let's is this a true or false statement I said let's construct the negation so whatever these two statements are they have the exact opposite truth values okay so that's uh, great so let's do one more uh one more of these just to just to make sure that we're beginning to catch on because I understand that this uh uh so here we go um let me turn to the problem section let's see because I'm not good at thinking things up right on the Oh, there we go. Okay. All horses you waited all this time for this are brown. There you go. That's what I found in the book. Again, doesn't matter if that's a true statement, doesn't matter if it's a false statement. What I want to know is what is the negation? What changes the value? Okay, so the negation of this. What is the negation? Somebody tell me. Well done. Change the all to the sum. And this is a positive verb, so we'll change it to a negative. And those are opposites. Okay, those have different truth values, whatever, whatever the truth is. Better? Yeah. So far, so good? Okay. So that's a little bit more about the negation of something that you, that you probably wanted to know. Now we're going to talk about the, all the connectives and I, here's my example. We're going to get so tired of this example by the end. You'll be thanking me for a new one a little later. So here we go. I'm going to define three simple statements because we're going to talk about the relationship between the actual statements that we can speak in a sentence and the mathematics of it. So statement P is going to be the house is for sale. Statement Q, and I'll give you a ch chance to write this down. We can afford the house. And statement R, we're gonna have three simple statements. The house has a garage. Give me a moment with those. What type of connectors is this? We're going to go through all five of the connectors right now. These okay. are just my simple statements uh, that I'm going to uh, I'm going to use the connectors. Uh, okay. okay, great question. And we're going to look at this symbolically. So we're going to do a little bit of writing. I'm sorry if you get writer's cramp. I'll, I'll go slow. Okay, so the last little bit about the negation I just want to say is how would we how would we notate the negation symbolically? So one fi final thing about the negation, the symbol that you will see for the negation is a squiggly. I think it's called a tilde, but I call it the squiggly. So for instance, if I if I give you this instruction, and this is the instruction, write the sentence represented by this symbol. And it is squiggly P. I'll write it down in a minute, but let's just say it together. If P is the house is for sale, then squiggly P is the house is not for sale. Great. What's wrong? So squiggly means like not. Okay. The squiggly means I'm creating the truth. Uh, I'm changing the truth value. So what we're doing here is we are we are taking these statements that are in words and we are going to talk about writing them symbolically because I don't want to do all this writing all the time and when when we do the logic we're going to we're going to talk about we're going to talk about how the truth values of these statements impacts the truth value of the compound statements okay so instead of writing this out every time i'm just saying instead of the house is for sale i'm going to call that statement p 
Instead of we can afford the house, I'm going to call that statement Q. So the negation, which we were just talking about, that changes the truth value, the symbol for it, the math symbol, is a squiggly. Kind of like in arithmetic, what's the symbol for the negation? It's a straight line, like minus five, right? That's the negation symbol in arithmetic. This is the negation symbol in logic. Have I answered your question? Because you feeling okay? Okay, please. Uh, if you have anything, I know logic can be uh, confusing at first. I'm not used to thinking like this. So squiggly P is the house is not for sale. So we're just doing the same thing we did a moment ago, just with a symbol instead of, uh, instead of uh, without it. I'm gonna write a sentence down and then I want you to write what the symbol would be for this. So if I say the house has no garage, So that's the, that's the sentence. Now I want you to do your best attempt at writing that symbolically. Okay, what's the symbol you would use? You said it? Yeah. So the house has a garage, that's R, right? But this is the negation, so I'm going to write squiggly R. Oh, okay. I think I thought squiggly P was like the negation. The P is just the statement. I'm calling this statement P. I'm calling that statement Q. I've, I've defined my terms. Okay, so since that clicked, let me just do one more, okay, based on those. Just to me, I want everybody to be on the same page, feeling good about this, because I, I know this, this is goofy, but this is going to be a big part of the problems we do, because one of the first things we do when we when we look to see if an argument is valid or invalid is we're going to take the written argument and we're going to convert it to symbols first. Okay, so that's the very first thing. That's this, so this is important. Yes. So you could just do the symbol and then the letter, or you have to like do the symbol, the letter, and then write it out. Oh, what I did here is I gave you the symbol this time and I said, what's the statement? And this time I gave you the statement and said, what's the symbol? So we're just practicing going back and forth. Okay, okay. yeah, you won't always have to, to write everything out. We're just looking at this relationship and that's what we're going to be doing in this section. And you're going to, I mean, you're already tired of it, but you're going to get tired of it. But we're going forward, when we come back next time, you're not always going to have to write everything out, all the words. Okay, that's my goal is to try to teach you the relationship between the words and the symbols here today so that we don't have to do that going forward. Here's one more. I'm going to write, the, again, I'm going to write the sentence, and I just would like you please to write the symbol that represents this. So we cannot afford the house. So given that we can't afford the house, I is represented by statement Q, what represents this? Squiggly Q. Okay. The negation of the statement Q. Better? Doing all right? Thank you for asking questions. I love it. Instead, I'm glad you're not just sitting there and letting me talk and feel good about myself. All right. That's the first connective, and we've kind of exhausted everything we can possibly talk about with the negation. The next one is what's called the conjunction. In words, the conjunction would be represented by the word and, uh, the word but, and the word however, I think our book uses sometimes, is a conjunction. The symbol for the conjunction is what it's called a caret on the keyboard uh, if, if you're typing, but it's just a triangle without the bottom. That's the symbol. Okay, so like a plus sign tells you to add things together, and a division sign tells you to, to divide. This tells you that you're using a conjunction in logic. Okay, so this is the symbol. I'm sorry? Um, those are the only three words you see in this class. I'm 99.9% .9 positive. 
Um, in fact, most of the time, like 95% of the time, it's going to be the word and. But I know sometimes our, our, our book in the My Math Lab will use but, however, is rarer. So that I just want you prepared for anything you might see. So again, we're going to go both ways and we're going to do an example of each. So let's say this if I have P caret Q, that's the symbol. Well, let's speak it in words and then we'll write it down so it's in your notes. So when you're reviewing later, you can see it. So what is what is P? Tell me that. The house is for sale. The caret means and. And then Q is we can afford the house. Okay, so we're taking the letters. P means the house is for sale. Q means we can afford the house. And we're connecting them with the caret, which means and. It's the conjunction. So I'm going to write that down. P is the house is for sale. Try to keep these statements short. And I'm going to underline the and because that's my caret. The how uh, we can afford the house. Yep. This is our second connective. The first one was the negation. This one is called the conjunction. It's our second of the five that we're going to have. And there's only these five in this. Uh, in this. If you have any interest in computers, logic is used a lot in computer circuitry to figure out like where the electric the electricity flows to what chip or whatever. So if you have any sort of interest in that sort of thing, uh, logic circuits are, my daughter's doing some electrical engineering and she uses this stuff all, all the time. So uh, so here's one for you, same thing. Okay, I'm just gonna write down the symbols and I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to write down what you think this represents. So let's say uh, R caret P. Um, some of them might have to type, but I think in this, because they want you to avoid typos, they're going to give you multiple choice. Okay. But on the test, I will give you these. I don't look just like this on the test. You'll be given these, and then I might say, what is, write down the words for this. All right, what does R represent? Okay, the house has a garage. What does the carrot represent? And, and then what does P represent? We do a couple examples of going backwards. So in both of these examples, I gave you the symbols. We wrote out the words. We're going to do more of these as we go through the connectives. So hopefully, it's slowly starting to to sink in. And uh, if we're going to keep doing more examples, hopefully until it does. Here's the next one. I want you to do your best. Okay, I'm going to write the sentence. You're going to write the sentence. Then right below it, I want you to write what does this look like in symbols. Okay, because that's what we'll do our operations on. So here's the first one. We can afford the house. And the house is for sale. How do we represent we can afford the house? Q, the word and, it's a carrot. And then the house is for sale is represented with Q and P. One more, and then we'll go to the next connective, but I'm gonna dabble a little bit in combining 
a little bit. So read carefully and know that we have two connectives that we're using right now. So it goes like this. The house is not for sale. And Okay, so here's where you need to read, read carefully. This first statement says the house is not for sale. And what is that symbolically? The house is not for sale. Perfect. The house is for sale is P, but then the not makes it squiggly P, the negation. The and is a carrot. The house has a garage. And the house has a garage is... Sounds like I'm getting a little more feedback. So we're getting there. Okay. So again, any questions you have, please ask. We're going to just do the same thing with, with the other connectives. This is our practice. When we come back on Tuesday, then we're going to talk about truth values and how these connectives interact with each other. So the next one is what's called the disjunction. The disjunction, uh, pretty much the only word that we use in this class for the disjunction that I'm aware of, if you, if you find something else, let me know, is the word or. The disjunction is the word or. And the symbol for the disjunction is a V. Okay, it's the carrot turned upside down, pointing down. So here's what I would like you to do, okay? Because we, we've done we've done some together. Uh, I'm going to give you the chance to, to do these. So what I would like you to do is just real quick write down what you think the words for Q, upside down carrot, squiggly are. Write write down what you think that represents. Q upside down carrot or disjunction squiggly are. I'm just going to get started writing down. If you're still writing, keep writing. So Q is we can afford the house. The upside down carrot, the disjunction means or. And then the squiggly R is the negation of the statement R. It's the, the house has no garage or the house does not have a garage. Anybody got a question about that? Okay, well, while you're finishing up, I will write down a statement and I just want you to write it symbolically. And then if there's no questions, if you feel like it's sinking a little more, we'll go to the fourth of the connectives. So the next one is, uh, is gonna be this. Let's say that we have uh, the house is not for sale.
or we cannot afford the house. So write that as symbols, please. What's the symbol for the house is not for sale? Squiggly B, you're right. The or is the disjunction, so a B. And then we cannot afford the house. That is squiggly Q. Great job. Anybody got a question, comment, or concern? We're doing all right. One thing I want to mention before I go on to the next connective, because I will, I will forget this and then You'll have a question about it on the homework, and then I'll feel real bad. So, if you see this as a symbol, let's say I, I'm just going to keep the statement symbol. Let's simple. Let's say it's P or Q, but I have it in parentheses, and there's a squiggly out in front. So you're going to be asked. This is going to be a homework problem. There'll be a couple of these. There's a squiggly out in front of some parentheses. What do you do there? Well, here's the words to use for this. Because now we're negating two statements out in a row. How do I do that? So what you do when you see the squiggly out in front, you start off with the words, it is false that. So what you're saying, since you're changing this, since you're changing the truth value, is you're saying it is false that saying you're changing the truth value of everything that comes next. So it is false that, and then I'll finish the statement. If you just want to use an ellipsis here, we've already, we've already done this statement, but it is false that the house is for sale. Or, and then Q, we can afford the house. Similarly, if you're doing a problem in the homework and it starts off with the words and it starts off with the word, it is false that. Well, then what that means is you're going to start with a squiggly and everything that comes next is in parentheses. Okay, so this goes back and forth both ways. So keep that example in mind because there are definitely a few of those in the homework. That's why I wanted to make sure to mention it. All right, so we've done three of the, uh, three of the five connectives. Here's the fourth one. This one's called the conditional. A conditional statement, a conditional statement is given by the words if, and then you'll have something, and then then, and then you'll have something. If, then, if, then statement is, is called a conditional statement. The symbol for a conditional statement is an arrow going from one end to the other. Okay, so for instance, here, uh, here is our statement, P arrow Q, my conditional statement. I'm going to walk along with you on this one, so you don't have to. You don't, you don't have to be going ahead unless you, you feel like you know it. As soon as you see the arrow, it tells you it's a conditional statement. It tells you that the first word is going to be if. The arrow tells you it's an if-then statement, so the first word is going to be if. If the house is for sale.
And now before I go to the statement Q, I write then. I'm going to underline those two parts, the if and the then. Those are the words that always go with our conditional statement. If the house is for sale, then we can afford the house. I'm going to give you one in symbols, and I want you to just do the same thing. Let's say that we have R arrow Q. Write that in words, please. R arrow Q. You can combine any of the five rules, but what I'm going to tell the last thing we're going to talk about, because all of the statements we've done have only had two, right? The last thing we're going to do is what happens when I have more than two statements? How do I know which ones go together? Which I think might be what you're driving at there. And, and that is great, Not a good question, and we'll get to that. It'll be the very, the very last thing. In fact, at some point, I'll change up our, our statements because we're I'm sure we're all tired of the house being for sale at this point. Okay. So this one, again, as soon as I see the arrow, what that tells me is that my first word is going to be if, okay? It's a conditional statement. So then if the house has a garage, And once I'm done with that statement, before I get to the statement Q, I write then. Okay, those two words always go together if, then. And then the then here is we can afford the house. Before I erase these, I just want to tell you a, a couple other words that go along with our, with our if then statements. Okay, the first part of the statement. Uh, whatever comes after the if, the reason this is called a conditional statement is that's the condition. That is what has to be met for the conditional statement to apply. So this is the condition. The second part. This is what happens when the condition is meant. There's a couple of words. I call this the consequence. That's the word I will use. Our book will use a different form of the, sometimes they'll use consequence too. They use both, I believe. They'll use consequent. Okay, so, this is the condition. This is what has to be met in order for the then to happen. This is what will happen. So for instance, I think on the syllabus, it might not have been written like this, but it's basically it had the implication, if you get a 90, then you get an A, right? So the condition there is if you get a 90, you get a 90. So if you get the 90, what do you expect to get on your report card or on, on passport? An A, right? You met the condition, so you will get the consequence. And we're going to talk about this in more detail when we come back and talk about truth values. What if you got an 85? Does that statement, if you get a 90, then you get an A, and you got an 85, does that statement apply? No, okay? There'd be a different conditional statement, okay? So that's the condition is the part that kind of uh, that activates this statement right here. What's that? The requirement, yeah, that's another way to think about it. Perfect. All right, so our last of our five connectives and the last examples we will use these for, we'll, we'll write up a fresh example in just a minute, is called the by condition. The 
The biconditional means that both statements are conditions and both statements are consequences. It goes both ways. And so for that reason, the symbol for the biconditional is a double arrow like this. Basically, it's two if-then statements going both ways, but we don't write it like that. The words for the biconditional are if and only if. So if you've ever said those words to somebody, uh, if and only if, you used the biconditional, maybe even realize you were doing it, but you did. It sometimes gets abbreviated because that's a lot of that's a lot of words right there. So sometimes it's if with two Fs. So if you write if with two Fs on the test, I'll I'll understand what you mean. Or if you write if and only if because you don't trust me to notice both Fs. Well, that's that's fair and legitimate concern. Uh, either, either one's fine. So what I would like you, or well, I'll do this. I'll do this first one, and I'll have one for you, and then we'll be done with these examples. So let's say that I have this uh, P, and then a double arrow, and then just to keep it spicy, we'll go squiggly Q. I'm going to write this one out with you, so you don't have to go ahead. I'm just trying not to. I'm not I'm trying not to get ahead of you and and cause you anxiety any more than you're already experiencing because logic's sometimes weird. Here goes. P is the house is for sale. Still. And now that I've got the double arrow, the words that represent the double arrow, if and only if. Squiggly Q, well, Q is we can afford the house. And so squiggly Q is we cannot afford the house. <laughs> sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. This is the basics of logic, yes, where that we're defining here. What you've written here, the reason it's called the biconditional is you've written down all at once. This is the abbreviation for two conditional statements. So what you've written down is going this way. If the house is for sale, then we cannot afford the house. I guess it's out of our price range. Okay, if the house is for sale, then we can't afford it. But it also says, going this way, if we cannot afford the house, then the house is for sale. Okay, so that it, it's a conditional statement going both ways. So here's your last one that I would like you to please write in words. And it is this, let's go, uh, let's go squiggly Q, arrow, and uh, R. So squiggly Q, once again, we saw it in the previous example, I should have done something else. We cannot afford the house still. If and only if. R, which is the house has a garage. All right, so I'm done with these statements. We've just got a few more examples to go. You've almost made it through the first day of logic, so congratulations. So we're going to change these statements. This is just a, a nice book example. Maybe it'll make more sense. P is the temperature is 90. Q is the air conditioner is working. And R 
is the apartment is empty. All right, so the last thing that I want to mention, you, you know, as I think about the connectives that you need to know and symbols and things like that. Uh, the last thing is uh, speaking to the idea of what happens if I have more than two statements. All the things we've done we just had two. If I have more than two, how do I know they go together? So that is a that's a great question. So here is uh, here's the problem we're going to do. Give you a minute to write this down. We're going to do two or three of these, so you're almost done. So the temperature is 90. And the AC is not working. I'm going to put a comma. Comma is important. Or the apartment is empty. Give you a moment to write all that down. I'm going to do this one with you, so uh, don't worry about getting ahead of the game. So I've got this example. And I'm going to have one more just like this for you, and then I'm going to have one more for you where you do the reverse, okay, because I want to just make this last point. When you have more than two statements, this comma indicates grouping, okay? What it's telling you is all the stuff to the left of the comma goes together, and all the stuff to the right of the comma goes together if there's more than one thing, okay? So, and to indicate grouping, just like arithmetic, we're going to use parentheses. So let's go through this uh, bit by bit. And if you have a question, let me know. So it starts out, the temperature is 90. What is that? P. And conjunction, the carrot, yes. The AC is not working. Squiggly Q, notice I haven't done anything yet until I see the comma. What does the comma tell me about those two statements? They're going to go together. They're on the same side of the comma. So I'm going to put parentheses around them because of the comma. Okay, so I'm going to draw an arrow to those parentheses. This comma tells you to put those parentheses. Now, if there was more than one statement on this side, you'd use another pair of parentheses, pair of parentheses over here. But we've only got one statement. So we've got or. What's the symbol for or? The V. The apartment is empty. And that is R. There you go. Can you put the last part of it? Please? Not when there's just one statement. Oh. I mean, it wouldn't be wrong. It's just not needed. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, like I said, I've got. I'm going to have one more like this for you, and then I'm going to have a statement that I write in symbols that I want you to write in words. And these are going to be our last two examples uh, of the day. Okay. So you've done great. You've endured it. Proud of you. So let's do this. Let's say the AC is working. Uh, let's see. The AC is working or the temperature is not 90, comma, if and only if, and I'm going to use the abbreviation, the if, and what's the one I haven't used, if the apartment is empty.
I'm just going to go bit by bit. Let me know if you got a question. So the AC is working. That is what? Q. The word or? V. This junction. The temperature is not 90. Squiggly V. I notice there's a comma. So that comma tells me to do what? Put those in parentheses. If and only if. The double arrow and the apartment is empty is R. Okay, you know R? Last prop. Can I erase this? Because I want to write this down. So I'm going to write something in symbols, and I, I just want you to make your best attempt. Okay, remember we're learning here. So I would like you to do R, arrow, and in parentheses, uh, P and squiggly Q. Give it a try. If you need a hint, my hint would be, what does this arrow tell you the first word has to be? So here goes. This is a conditional statement because the arrow is the primary. It's outside the parentheses. So it's the primary thing linking everything together. So because of this arrow, I'm going to start with the word if. And that's what tells me that. So it's if the apartment is empty. Okay, but I've got stuff grouped on the other side, right? So that means I have to put what after the word empty? Comma, because I got to let everybody know that the grouping, that this, that this R is standing alone and this stuff's going to be grouped now. So I got to put a comma. You with me? I know this is a hard problem, so I wanted to finish with a flourish. Okay, but if you, got, if you can understand any part or most of this, you're doing a great job today. Okay, if the apartment is empty, comma, then, then the temperature is 90. And the AC is not working. Unreasonable. And once again, if you were reading this and if you're doing it vice versa, the thing that would tell you that these two things are grouped and have parentheses is they are on the same side of the comma. Okay, that's what gives you that clue. So practice that. It's going to be uh, next week. We're going to use this. We're going to do more fun things with logic next week. This was kind of, I understand, a little bit dry, but we had to get used to working with the symbols. 